much for sharing your time with us. Um, this Mahav is a well-known well, expert. He was the leading author of the Bell Energy Report, the monthly publication of International Bell Energy Association uh, Agency. Now, uh, he's a senior fellow at the Center of uh, Global Energy Policy Project. Ago, they were roughly half, isn't that? Oh, but would you like, would you mind to share your views with us about the prospect of the bond market? Sure. Uh, so, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks uh, to you all for coming on a, on a Saturday morning, uh, waking up uh, early on the weekend. Uh, very much appreciated. I look forward to hearing and learning from you more than uh, anything else, more than imparting uh, any particular pearls of wisdom on you. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's an interest, uh, interesting time in the, in the oil market, so it's an interesting time to try to think about uh, the outlook and uh, where we belong. Um, it's always an interesting time in the oil market, there's always surprises, uh, things are always unexpected. Experts are always uh, caught uh, off guard, uh, on footed in their predictions. But these days, perhaps more than uh, more than ever. So, what I would like to do is share some some remarks, some views with you. Uh, since we're a small group and it's uh, Saturday morning, I haven't prepared a very formal presentation with slides and PowerPoint or anything. Uh, and I would encourage you to interrupt me if you if you need, as we uh, make it more conversation than uh, than a lecture. Uh, <clears throat> perhaps to to get the to jumpstart the conversation, I, I would tackle uh, two or three ideas. One is the, the question of the, uh, the price regime, um, the, the difficulties in understanding pricing dynamics, the tendency to focus on the old price as a, as a metaphor for uh, many other things that uh, sometimes only have uh, remote connections with the, with the oil economy and the oil market. Um, so uncertainty about the short term, uncertainty about price formation about the dynamics of the market uh, in the short term. I think we today we need to talk about uncertainties about the long term, um, the, what is now uh, commonly called peak oil demand, the idea that the market will soon reach an inflection point where instead of continuing to grow as it has for the last 150 years, uh, oil demand will start going down, plateau maybe or, or even contract, perhaps even plummet rapidly various views about this. So this is a, a long-term concern, but it's a long-term concern, a long-term issue that has very real implications for the short term as well. And, um, and the last point maybe I will touch on is the people always talk about uh, uh, structural changes in the market, funding changes, revolutions, uh, transformative movements. Shale has been described as a transformative force in the oil market, and I'll explain a little bit uh, that in a second. But I think there's another uh, element that is transformative that will dramatically change the, the oil industry, but also the oil market, and that's the, the data revolution, the big data, the artificial intelligence revolution that's starting to impact the oil industry and the oil market in a big way. So if you're okay with that uh, agenda, uh, sure. short term, so the title, uh, back where we belong, why, why this title? There's been a series of conflicting narratives about the, the oil price over the last 20 years. Uh, the market always looks for a narrative, always looks for a grand vision, 
a kind of a, a big picture uh, to frame short-term day-to-day developments in the oil price. So when the price goes down, there's a tendency among uh, market, market participants to describe the, the, uh, the drop in the oil price as a kind of a structural change. The price will keep going down uh, to the, for the foreseeable future. When the price goes up, uh, it will never go down again. It's, uh, so we've been there uh, in the last 15 years. Back in 2008, when oil, the oil price reached a, a record high of $147, uh, there were a lot of people, experts, uh, distinguished economists, uh, not uh, people without any knowledge, but deep, deeply knowledgeable people who said, yes, the, the oil price will never go down, will never go below $100 again. It will keep going up. The age of cheap oil is over. The age of easy oil is over. Uh, and Manuel and I uh, both know the distinguished colleague who used that quote a lot uh, around 2008, 2009. Uh, and then, uh, and the idea then was that oil was finite. Uh, there was uh, actually uh, a prominent uh, uh, industry banker here in the US who wrote a book um, to uh, promote the idea that Saudi oil was uh, coming down, was our Saudi reserves were getting drained, and the idea that oil would the Saudi Arabia would always be there to supply the market was, was wrong. Uh, there was a lot of emphasis on peak oil, so the idea of finite resources, and at the same time, uh, oil demand was growing rapidly and growing much faster than anybody had expected. China, uh, Chinese demand uh, took off dramatically in 2003, 2004. There was a couple of years of very cold growth in Chinese demand, which seemed to be the beginning of a trend, which seemed to be the beginning of a, an unstoppable thirst for oil uh, from China, but from also from other emerging economies uh, afterwards. So the idea was growing competition from world economic, competing economic world powers for finite resources. And at that time, there was a whole bunch of books written about uh, the inevitability of uh, conflict wars around oil. Uh, there's a, a professor, uh, Michael Clare, who wrote a couple of books uh, about the coming oil wars, and he was not the only one. Uh, others did the same too, it was a whole cottage industry. Actually, uh, if you look at the history of the oil market, there's been various times of rising prices of, uh, of bull markets in the, in the history of the oil industry. Uh, one was uh, in the 20s, uh, there, there were others at different times in history, and during those times, there were repeatedly concerns about conflict wars, about uh, resource, uh, resource wars, uh, oil conflicts, and so on. Um, so that was the dominant theory in uh, around 2008, 2009. Then the, the financial crisis came in 2008. Uh, uh, the price collapsed uh, suddenly to somewhere around $30, from $147 in just a matter of weeks. Um, uh, then the price recovered somewhat uh, and plateaued around $110, $115 for Brent for a fairly extended period of time, a few years. And uh, there was a view that the, the oil market had found some kind of balance some kind of equilibrium. Uh, but then in 2014, the price collapsed. Uh, first in June, uh, the, uh, um, there was a, a, a significant drop uh, between June and November. In November, OPEC had a scheduled meeting uh, at which many oil economies, analysts, industry participants expected OPEC to come in and cut production to stabilize the price. OPEC surprised the market by saying, we're not going to try to stabilize the price. We're going to go for market share. We're going to increase production as much as we can and reclaim, reclaim market share that we've lost in the last few years. And that started a further decline in prices. Uh, the price fell even harder. Um, and the narrative in oil industry changed completely and it became the idea <coughs> of a complete reversal of an age of abundance and an age of low prices. The, the oil price would never go up again, would never go above 100 or even above maybe 80 again. And uh, the, the question was not competition for scarce resources among consumers, it became competition among producers for scarce markets, for limited markets. Uh, and now here we are, uh, just uh, four years after 2014. Um, the, shale, the shale industry, which was a major part of the narrative of oil abundance, is still very much with us, it's actually done very well. 
uh, even through the period of low prices, surprisingly well, much better than anybody expected. But despite its success, the oil price was rebounding again. Uh, we're now at $85 per Brent, uh, moving up rapidly. And as Professor Pino uh, just said, uh, there's growing expectations that the oil price will continue to increase and maybe reach $100 before the end of the year or early next year. So how can we explain this? Uh, the, the, the key idea behind the, the narrative of low oil for longer, low prices for a longer period of time, was the idea that shale had dramatically transformed the market, that shale, shale oil uh, had really unlocked uh, an immense resource, uh, massive resource in, in the US, but also a very large resource uh, in other countries as well, pretty much everywhere around the world, particularly in Argentina, in China, in Russia, uh, in other, other places as well. So how, how, did, how did we get to, to, how did we get there? How can we account for this, uh, this term? What, what do you think? Let me, let me ask you the question for a second. So the question, wait, just to reiterate the question, it was the, why isn't shale keeping prices lower for longer? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, I mean, what kind of narrative do you think will, can you come up with to explain this high price, surprisingly you know, stronger price, and what, what kind of narrative could you imagine will, will um, start dominating the talk in the next few months? I think um, <clears throat> the federal government response with Donald Trump calling out OPEC and then not ignoring the fact that he passed sanctions on Iran again and a bill in Congress called NOPEC, so that way the US can sue OPEC for being a cartel. I think that's gonna be the narrative that everyone coalesces around over the next few months. Right, okay, so uh, anybody else has uh, other ideas? I think like, re-sanctioning Iran um, has caused um, kind of like some lack, lack of confidence in the, like, their production and like competition within OPEC of you know, like trying to hold market share. So now, it's like uh, Saudi Arabia um, is like politically in competition with Iran, um, but also you know to maintain kind of the largest market share of production in OPEC. So I think that putting a cap on Iran has kind of caused some like a uh, lack of confidence in the markets and, and um, disruptions in supply chain, perhaps. I know that there is a the Vienna group, mm -hmm. which uh, also uh, tends to balance uh, cuts or like, uh, like supplier demand. And because uh, we have right now issues with supply from Iran, Libya, and Venezuela, uh, the Vienna group has recently announced to increase uh, its cuts, uh, like just to decrease its cuts from 1.8 uh, million barrels per day to 1.8. Uh, uh, so what do you think that uh, will these issues with other suppliers, like non-dominant suppliers, will be balanced by major suppliers like Russia or Saudi Arabia? Right, so I think what you're touching at, what you're getting at, are really uh, uh, political or geopolitical factors that play in the oil market. So I think when you, when you think about the period of low prices, or lower prices that we went through between 2014 and 2018, earlier this year. Uh, it was really the, the key driver, I think the key element in the narrative of low prices was technology. Right? The, there had been high prices around uh, 2008 that had encouraged a lot of investment in new technologies like shale oil. You know, we knew shale existed, but we didn't think it was economical. The technology was not there to exploit it, to, to bring it to market economically. But with high prices, that encourage investors to really pour uh, dollars into finding technologies to get the, the shale oil out. Uh, that succeeded uh, beyond expectations. Tremendous amounts of oil started coming out of the US. Uh, the growth in US production uh, in the last few years has been the, the steepest, the fastest growth ever recorded in the history of the, of the oil industry since the very beginning uh, for many things country in such a short period of time and such a sustainable period as well. So this, this is a technological revolution. Um, and um, I think the, the other thing is that shale, initially at least, 
was seen as a type of industry that was profoundly different from the, the conventional uh, oil industry, from the rest of the, the industry, in that shale, uh, initially, shale companies were not big oil companies like Exxon, Chevron, you know, billions of dollars of uh, revenues, budget, uh, expenses, and so on, but where uh, small companies, sometimes privately owned, family owned, uh, very nimble, uh, with very little money, uh, often highly leveraged, big loans uh, for, the, for their size. Uh, and so very, very nimble, very innovative, very, uh, very pragmatic, very uh, 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 flexible, uh, very quick to act, uh, but also working on a fairly low budget. Uh, the, uh, fairly low budget and on a very tight short cycle. So initially, if you looked at the makeup of the shale oil industry, uh, really you had hundreds of companies, sometimes quite small, uh, gathering leases, a couple of leases somewhere in Texas, in Mexico, or North Dakota, uh, and uh, putting together some loans, a few million dollars of, uh, of uh, funding, and then drilling a hole and within months, getting oil in the market to supply the market. This is in contrast with major projects like the likes of Exxon, Chevron, or Petro China, uh, where you uh, have to put together uh, very complex uh, plannings uh, over periods of years, uh, requiring uh, billions or, or even uh, the double digit uh, billions, numbers of billions of dollars in investment, uh, which uh, typically take you know, years to, to, to come to fruition. So a very different makeup of the industry, allowing much more flexibility, much more responsiveness. So that was the view, uh, kind of techno-economical view of a non-market that was dramatically changed. Uh, the DNA of the market was seen to have changed dramatically. Uh, but now what we see is that this growth in shale, which continued despite OPEC's move for market share, despite OPEC's deliberate um, um, lack of concern for the market, which may be effort to crush the market further in 2014, 2015. Share has continued, has not crashed, has survived the low prices, has learned to become more economic, more efficient, to run on at a, at a lower price uh, even than before. Uh, and what's the, the part of the market that's really giving in is the big producers, the, the, the major producers like Venezuela, uh, Nigeria, um, Libya, countries that have uh, faced both political turmoil internally as well as a collapse in their, in their revenue, uh, and in collapse in the source of the, the vast majority of the budget. Uh, and then we have also geopolitics, uh, uh, an effort to, you know, the conflict between Sunni Islam and Shia Islam, an effort uh, today by the Trump uh, administration to crush Iran and to, uh, to bring uh, Iran uh, to its knees to re renegotiate nuclear agreement and maybe uh, uh, negotiate uh, agreements uh, and take on the aspects as well. So uh, a resurgence of geopolitical issues. Uh, and the, so when we move from the high price of the 2000 period to the low price of 2014 and the, the following years, we went from a period that was dominated by OPEC to a period where the market seemed very flexible. And really what set the market, what drove the market seemed to be the flexibility of the shale industry. So in the, in the history, I don't know if you covered this in the manual, but in the history of the oil industry, you, you have, basically, you can divide the history between different pricing regimes. Uh, if you start in the early days, uh, Rockefeller, uh, uh, John D. Rockefeller, who um, led the Standard Oil, the, the grandfather of Exxon, and a bunch of other companies, uh, really uh, put together a kind of a, a consortium of, a, Railroad that gave him control over the logistics of the oil market in the U.S. and that really set the, the stage for um, a kind of trust economy where one company really controlled the market and, and, and set the price. Uh, then uh, Congress intervened and <coughs> broke down uh, Standard Oil as part of the antitrust movement, uh, started by the muckraking uh, journalist of, uh, of the late 19th century, early 20th century. That led eventually to another form of control where the major oil companies, the, the, the successor companies to Standard Oil, uh, as well as a few others, got together and uh, entered into secret agreements to fix the price. 
there was a Seven Sisters regime, where the seven major folk artists in the world really uh, plotted basically together to define the set of plateau and the ceiling for prices and, and parcel the, the market amongst themselves and control the market. Then uh, those companies uh, became victim to the uh, decolonization movement and the, the rise of OPEC uh, in the 60s, and that led to the uh, an era that was dominated by OPEC, or, or, or that was seen as being dominated by OPEC. OPEC cut prices or uh, cut production to support prices, or when the, the price was too high uh, and the supply and demand balances were too tight, would bring new supply to the market to bring the price down again. <coughs> so that was a, an OPEC regime. Came then uh, uh, the shale industry that turned this regime upside down. Uh, because of its very low cycle, its very strong responsiveness to price signals, its ability to raise capital very quickly, to turn the capital very quickly into new production, but also its need for continued capital, uh, share that you need to keep drilling all the time, as opposed to you know, major projects where you spend billions up front, but then they all keep flowing at fairly low cost, and it's just a cash machine. With share, it's a low investment initially, but you have to keep drilling all the time. So that means if the price goes down, technically, to, or, 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 Technically, you would expect uh, producers to start getting back on investment and bringing the production down. So that creates, that turns the shale industry itself into the swing producer that OPEC had been uh, over the previous period of uh, 40 years or so. Uh, now uh, we realize that uh, shale is a dynamic participant in the market, is a key source of supply, the number one source of supply growth, but it's not enough to stabilize the market. To, to, uh, turn into, to establish its own pricing regime. And uh, the price is now buffeted by uh, growth from, from uh, share on one hand, but also um, the collapsing of various uh, oil producing economies, particularly Venezuela, uh, and major part of Venezuela, and the, 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 the conflict uh, around uh, Iran and the nuclear program there. So it's, it's a it's very interesting, and the, the narrative keeps changing, and I think we're probably on the cusp of uh, yet another narrative. This is uncertainty for the short term or for the current situation, but it's difficult to come up with a narrative. It's, uh, the narrative keeps changing, and part of the game of, of uh, oil market analysis is really to adjust the narrative, or to change the narrative according with market conditions. What's new also today and, and is that this uncertainty that affects the short term or the near term is even greater regarding the longer term, right? Uh, where will demand be in 20 years, in 30 years, maybe 15 years, in 50 years, has become an issue of dramatic uncertainty uh, and of extreme uh, uh, urgency and extreme relevance for policymakers as well as investors in the, in the industry. So this was not always the case uh, until very recently demand growth was taken for granted. It was assumed that as the economy kept growing, uh, the global economy kept growing, all demand would grow accordingly, uh, in sync with that, perhaps at a decreasing pace uh, over the years as efficiency improvements would uh, uh, be uh, achieved. Uh, there was some expectation that demand growth would start to be a little bit less fast than economic growth, but there was for until now an assumption that if the economy grew, all demand would grow, and all itself, uh, the growth of the oil market was itself the uh, um, lifeline of the global economy, what really allowed uh, countries to grow, to become more affluent, uh, to produce more, uh, to uh, improve their productivity, and to, uh, and to increase uh, the quality of life and the well-being of, uh, of their population. Uh, so this assumption now is, is, uh, is, is, has become uh, very much in doubt, uh, largely because of broader concerns about climate change and, and global warming. So uh, in order to keep uh, global warming within acceptable limits, uh, it's understood that uh, the rise in temperature has to be kept within two degrees of uh, where it was at the dawn of the industrial age. So that requires cutting back on greenhouse gas emissions, and there's a broad consensus that you can't really get to two degrees without significantly, significantly cutting back on hydrocarbon consumptions, including uh, including in the oil 
uh, sector. So you have to cut back on, on the major sources of greenhouse gas emissions like coal, but also uh, oil in a big way. And this has essentially uh, driven expectations of peak demand that uh, far from growing continuously, the time was coming when oil demand would have to go down, would have to be turned around to be kept under control. And, Human, uh, the human economy, the global economy, would have to turn from being an oil-based economy to a renewable-based economy or sustainable economy. Um, this is not, this is, so it, it's very interesting because this debate has been picking up a lot of momentum just in the last few years. Uh, as recently as, I think, 2014, 2015, peak demand was not a, a term you heard so often. It was kind of a provocative statement because Concerns have been very much about big supply. So the idea that the, the, the inflection point in the future for market would come from demand rather than supply was kind of a novel idea, uh, a fringe idea that was not very widely accepted. Since uh, about 2014, 2015, it's become very broadly uh, accepted by, by everyone. There's hardly uh, a week or a few, a few days when you don't see a story about the, uh, the clean transition and big demand in the not only in the trade press, but in the financial press, Financial Times, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and so on. Um, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty about when that peak will come. Uh, for a long time, the, the, the main promoters of this idea were the uh, environmentalists and the NGOs that advocated for a transition away from oil. Remarkably, this, this concept, this notion of big demand is now adopted by the industry itself. Uh, more and more companies are now uh, producing uh, energy outlooks uh, that they release to the public, the investors, but also the public at large, in which they spell out their projections of global demand and supply trends for various types of fuel. And more and more companies are now forecasting a peak in demand within their forecasting period. So there was a time initially, a few years ago, when most companies would say, yes, big demand will come one day, you know, uh, all is not, uh, all is finite, uh, and we need to you know, become cleaner, so there will be big demand one day, but it's far out in the future, it's beyond, beyond our forecast period. Um, and gradually, we've seen more and more companies bring that, that big demand uh, output on this side of the horizon, uh, within the forecast period. Uh, so companies like uh, Statoil that now produce scenarios that uh, see, uh, many of which see a uh, big demand sometimes quite soon. Um, BP uh, is starting to move the peak within their forecast period. Some other companies are still conservative. Exxon is a bit, uh, is a bit conservative and still sees big demand beyond the forecast horizon. Uh, but the, but there's a, the consensus is moving. And partly uh, the consensus is moving not always because of the conviction of uh, oil economists that the peak is around the corner, but to a large degree because of investor pressures. Investors are demanding of oil companies that they prepare for a transition, that they demonstrate that they are getting ready for a shift in the, uh, in the fuel mix towards a, a cleaner, uh, a more balanced, uh, uh, less carbon intensive uh, combination of fuels. Uh, and that they are prepared to deal with the risk of stranded assets, with the, the idea that oil, some oil, not all of the not all of the oil reserves will be taken out of the ground. Some oil will stay in the ground for lack of demand, and companies have to deal with this and be prepared and they know what to do with their, their oil. Make sure they have a market for their oil and get rid of what they don't need and so on and so forth. So it's a it's a changing conversation. Uh, I think you've discussed uh, you discussed the world energy outlook in your in your book. So it's very interesting because the world energy outlook normally is the voice of the consensus in the, in the industry. Normally is the benchmark that everybody has uh, based their own forecast on. Uh, and indeed, the, the, period, the, the World Energy Outlook, which comes every year, uh, every year in November, uh, is a kind of peer-reviewed document where the draft, before it's published, goes out to a lot of opinion makers, a lot of experts who are, who are solicited for feedback. The feedback comes, and the feedback gets incorporated into, into the draft. There's various iterations of the draft that really reflects the collective wisdom of, uh, of the industry. It's a kind of a, there's, some, there's a fair amount of uh, uh, crowdsourcing in the way of the, of the real 
terms of incorporating feedback from industry. And pretty much uh, on every topic over the years, the WIO has been the kind of uh, uh, reference, the kind of benchmark that uh, politicians can use when they speak to their uh, prime minister or ministers or, or uh, voters that uh, corporate planners can invoke when they defend their uh, suggestions to their board and to their, to their executives. Uh, but on the issue of big demand, uh, actually, uh, the, the world agent of the WIO has become an outlier. So the WIO still stay, sticks to the idea that peak, peak demand is beyond the horizon. Uh, that uh, there's you know, stronger reasons why demand will continue to grow. Uh, that shifts in transportation, uh, the spread of electric vehicles, um, uh, the move towards uh, more efficient uh, uses of power will not be enough to tilt the balance to, to cause a regression, a uh, uh, contraction in demand. Uh, so there's a, there's a disconnect here which is very interesting. Uh, it's interesting to try to think why that is the case, why the WIO is not incorporating big demand within its forecast. Uh, if you have any ideas, I'm curious to, to hear what you, what you think. But, uh, but some of the arguments that the WIO puts out are certainly very valid. Uh, and uh, essentially, I think, uh, maybe, maybe I touch a little bit on this and then I turn to something else. Is that okay, uh, Um Essentially, I think most of the big demand uh, views forecasts really uh, hinge on the spread of electric vehicles. And the idea that EVs are about to become the norm to displace uh, internal combustion engine vehicles uh, very, very quickly. Um, and I think there was a period, I think maybe it's starting to fade a little bit, but there was a couple of years where you couldn't go to an energy conference and, the, uh, and to attend any discussion of demand without somebody showing up a slide of uh, iPhones and, uh, and digital cameras. And the idea was that the, the, uh, the, the EVs were about to do to the, to the uh, traditional cars what the iPhone had done to landlines. Landlines uh, gave way to uh, cell phones, cell phones to smartphones uh, within 20 years. You know, uh, I don't know how many of you have a landline. I don't have a landline in my apartment. So there's, there's a view that technical revolutions happen very quickly. Uh, if you look at the, what happened with the iPhone, if you look at what happened with Kodak, uh, you know, film photography versus digital photography, that's kind of a preview of what's bound to happen with uh, in, the, in the transportation sector, in the passenger vehicle uh, industry. Uh, we are just about to see a rapid uh, um, replacement of ice vehicles with electric vehicles. That, I think, is the, the cornerstone, the, 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 the main uh, uh, base of the argument that we are likely to see uh, a turn in the oil market decline in demand. Uh, now, there's many reasons why uh, <coughs> one might doubt that EVs will penetrate so rapidly. Um, you know, if you follow what uh, Tesla's been doing, uh, it's an incredible, incredibly successful company. Uh, market cap is now higher than GM, uh, or was higher than GM, and I haven't followed the, the comparison in the last uh, couple of weeks. But uh, uh, you know, it took over GM in market cap, but it's been struggling since the beginning to meet its production target. It's extremely difficult to ramp up production of EVs, it's, uh, uh, there's very strong growth in, in China, and there's, you know, there's been very rapid growth, uh, undoubtedly in the last couple of years, but from an extremely low base, and really scaling up is extremely difficult. Then bringing, making sure that the charging infrastructure is in place to support the use of EVs seems a huge challenge, especially in uh, emerging markets like China, like uh, India, Africa, which is where most of the population growth is expected to come in the next uh, decade. So there, there's clearly hurdles, it's clearly major challenges to the spread of EVs. Uh, cost issues, uh, the life of batteries, and so on. <coughs> that is also very robust arguments uh, for saying that actually those hurdles will be overcome and uh, EVs will spread. You know, we, uh, views that we're on the, on the verge of a, of a breakthrough in battery technology, that battery costs are coming down, we continue to come down, the battery life really get extended, that EVs combined with automation and ride sharing, uh, we have uh, an incredibly uh, impactful uh, uh, 
is out on the on the market. It's not just EV; it's a combination of electrification on, on one hand, but also uh, uh, digitization, automation, bike sharing, all these things that will have a compounding effect and, and displace uh, high speed cars very very fast. So there's a debate about this. But even if you take the view that EVs will rapidly displace cars, traditional cars, and that's what uh, Fatih Birol, the head of the IE, has been arguing. Even if you assume that by 2040, half the sales of cars become EVs, which is a very ambitious target, uh, it's a very aggressive view. Even if you assume so, uh, it looks like that not going to be enough to bring all demand down. Uh, because you still will have uh, a, a lar large part of the fleet that will be ice speed cars. Uh, the turnover of the car fleet is very slow. It takes at least 15 years to replace to replace a car fleet, probably more than that, because a lot of cars get recycled in the first markets. Uh, so it, it's, it's a very slow process. It's very slow. It's very long. But also passenger vehicles are just about one fourth of the market. It's just about 25 percent of the whole market. It's not uh, it's not the whole market. It's the most visible size of the market is uh, what most people think when they think of, of oil, but uh, there's actually more oil being used for tracking, uh, for uh, uh, other smaller markets but which in aggregate uh, represent a big chunk like uh, the marine sector, aviation, uh, petrochemicals is a major source of, uh, of oil demand uh, for uh, fertilizers, for medicine, for plastics. Uh, so. Uh, it, it's perfectly possible to imagine a world where EVs uh, become much more accepted, penetrate the market, maybe become the norm <coughs> of some uh, mature parts of the market, like California or, or Europe, or maybe parts of China, uh, but where oil demand continues to grow rapidly in the rest of the market. So, uh, a lot of uncertainty. What I would say is that whatever the scenario, whatever, whether you look at scenarios of peak demand happening in 2022, there are, there are scenarios that see big demand in 2022. Or you look at big demand happening in 2050. In all these scenarios, despite the differences of views and the very strong contrast in the, in the uh, outcomes of the modeling process, there are commonalities. And the key commonality is that there's a contrast between pure industrialized markets and emerging economies. Industrialized markets, like basically OECD countries, the US, Canada, Japan, Europe, uh, Korea, uh, these countries uh, are expected to see a decline in demand under all scenarios, whether they're bullish or bearish. Uh, and indeed, some of these markets appear to have already reached peak demand. If you look at demand in many of those countries, uh, today it's lower than it was back in the 70s. So these markets are almost universally seen to, be, to face a decline in demand that emerging markets are all seem to experience growth in demand on aggregate at various spaces of growth uh, and with various distributions uh, uh, across regions. But virtually everyone agrees that demand in India, in South Asia, uh, in Latin America, will keep growing uh, even as demand elsewhere collapses. And the question is, will the contraction in uh, mature markets more than offset the growth in emerging markets, or will the growth in emerging markets be so rapid and so vast that it will overtake the decline in history? So it all hinges on countries like India, uh, Indonesia, uh, Pakistan, uh, the ASEAN countries in general, uh, Latin America, particularly Sub Saharan Africa, uh, which is, uh, as I mentioned, the continent where most of the population growth of the next 50 years is expected to come from, and therefore most of the economic growth as well. Um, what's remarkable is that the outlook that hinges on countries on which we don't know so much. The, the data transparency, the market transparency of Africa is basically zero. It's a very opaque market. The transparency of the Indian market is better than it was 15 years ago, but it's very poor. We don't fully understand what's going on in, in India. We don't really understand what's going on in China. Uh, we do better than in other markets. We have no idea what's going on on the demand side. We have a very 
reasonably robust view of supply. Uh, there's many uncertainties about supply, but supply is not so hard to track because in shade is fairly distributed, but in most of the world it's very concentrated in, in some key major fields, major producing regions, and it's not so difficult to model. Demand is by definition distributed, fragmented, dispersed, diverse. It's very difficult to track. People don't know what, it's, what demand is. There's very poor understanding of the actual uses of oil, what's driving the use of oil, what are the factors that are accelerating oil consumption or reining in oil consumption. We have some sense of it at a very high, high level, at a very micro level. We don't really understand it in the details. We certainly don't understand it in the countries on which the outcome of the market really will hinge. Although those countries, Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, we don't, we don't fully understand that. So that's, that's, a, that's a key point. It's, this whole discussion sounds abstract, sounds like, you know, it's, it's kind of, it doesn't really affect us today. It does affect us today very much because it affects very directly investment decisions by companies, both oil producing companies as well as consuming companies. All companies are now restricted in the investments they make because of concerns about long-term demand. Because for major oil companies like Exxon and Chevron, the projects typically that they normally would invest in are long-term projects with a life span of decades. And sometimes up to 10 years or more before the investments start producing oil and, and really getting, uh, reaching the market. So, so these long-term concerns are actually very relevant today, are driving investment decisions today by those companies, by other companies that look to take market share from them, by consumer companies that uh, have to decide what type of uh, uh, fuel they are likely to consume and how to invest uh, around that, and so on and so forth. So it's a very, very concrete result. And there's a strong possibility, which many increasingly have been uh, raising, that the idea of peak demand will actually be self-fulfilling because it will lead to underinvestment in oil production and uh, will cause, therefore, huge increases in prices, which in turn would force a demand response and a move either an economic uh, crash, an economic response to raw economic growth, or a move away from oil uh, and an investment in alternative sources of energy because of the excessively high price of oil. So there's a lot of possible implications of, of, of this discussion and you know, uh, this, this exercise of trying to forecast demand which for a long time in the industry was fairly immaterial, did not really matter so much because you could count on trends to continue, uh, is actually very relevant and has very basic implications on its own. The last point I would like to, to make is that this opacity of the market, which is which has been very distinctive uh, uh, characteristic of the oil industry, is about to change. So oil is the, the most actively uh, traded commodity in the world. That's the, the thing that uh, people trade the most, uh, the, the volumes and the, the financial uh, figures associated with oil trading you know, are, are the biggest. Uh, it's a hugely capital intensive industry, uh, but it's also a very data poor industry. It requires a lot of data but it doesn't have those data. Those data are missing on supply, on demand, and three on demand, even on supply. Many examples of this. Uh, one example, just as, a, as an illustration, is uh, in uh, a few years ago, a company called Chenier was investing billions of dollars into a plant to uh, regasify natural gas uh, because the, the expectation that it was working on was that the US would become an increasingly net uh, large net importer of gas. It was gas consumption, natural gas consumption in the US was bound to grow, but domestic production was falling, and the US would become increasingly import dependent, would have to import a lot of LNG. So Chenier started investing billions of dollars in, uh, in a plant uh, to, uh, to liquefy LNG that was expected to come into the US. Even as investment was being poured into shale gas fields, uh, in uh, Pennsylvania and uh, North Dakota and various parts of the U.S. and gas production in the U.S. was about to take off in a huge way. So uh, over the course of the project, the uh, regas liquefaction plant that was being built by Chenier was turned into a liquefaction uh, plant. And now it's a, it's a plant that 
on a daily basis processes massive amounts of gas being produced in the U.S. by shale producers, turns it into liquid that can get then be put on ships and exported around the world, including uh, to the Chinese market and, uh, and the Japanese market and other markets around the world, Latin America, Europe, and, and, and elsewhere. So uncertainty has been the, uh, a very key feature of the market for, for, for decades. Uh, but that's about to change, partly because of the big data revolution and because of the incredible advances made in machine learning and, and open, including in satellite imagery and the ability to treat signals from satellites uh, being beamed uh, um, increasingly around the world. So uh, um, this is something I have a direct uh, interest in and, and uh, direct involvement with because I've been the founder of a company that uh, is uh, aiming to, to leverage uh, satellite imagery and machine learning, uh, various forms of artificial intelligence to generate new information about the market, including uh, inventories of oil, uh, production, field production, field activity, shipping, but also demand. And the changes, the, the, the progress that this field is making are just incredible. Uh, our company was created two years ago. There's a few other companies in the same space, and we've been just growing incredibly rapidly. Uh, we're, in two years, we've now reached about 105 people. We're just about to hire another 70, 70 people. We've been actually, uh, there's a institution in London that trains uh, petroleum engineers, energy specialists. We've been the company that has hired the most graduates from that school for the last year, uh, more than Chevron, BP, or any other company, or, or of course, a new board company that are various uh, sorts. So it, it's a rapidly changing field. And the transparency that is being provided on the market is, is just uh, growing dramatically. We now cover 90% of the world uh, uh, crude storage facilities, uh, including not just the US and, and markets that are reasonably transparent, compared to others, but also uh, China, uh, India, the Middle East, uh, North Africa, uh, West Africa, you name it, every, everywhere in the world. The insights that we gain from this knowledge are very dramatic. We better understand price formation, we better understand the relationship between various benchmarks, uh, the changes in the, in the future curve between prices today and prices uh, deferred over a period of time, or the, the time spreads in the futures market. All these uh, uh, metrics, all these uh, aspects of market are now uh, uh, starting to be uh, understood in a completely different way that was not possible when uh, information was less, uh, less available. And soon, I think this, this harvesting of new data, uh, including geolocations, information on cell phones, for credit cards, you name it, will, I think, be uh, leveraged and be, be tapped to generate new insights about, about demand, about consumption, which has been the, the, the most opaque part of the market. We, don't, we still don't understand it today, uh, or we don't understand it well enough. Uh, this is partly why assessing the market today is so difficult, but forecasting the market is, is, is also so risky and so, so often uh, uh, turns out to be so off the mark. Um, but that, I think that's about to change. So um, that's a few a few thoughts. Uh, I hope that made sense. You've been very quiet. So you, you mentioned like the use of big data with satellite imagery. Um, I mean, I'm just thinking of examples of that. Is like is that you know using satellite imagery to count oil exports out of certain regions? Is it or or like can you? Are you is there a way you can look at trucks, like truck per load of like uh, like volumes of oil? Is, is is that the technology that's being like utilized or yeah yeah developing? all of that? So the, the, the key technology that we've been using uh, in our company is to look at the is to look with radar uh, imagery, not, not so much optical but radar. Mm -hmm. <coughs> look at floating moves. So crude, most food tanks, the, the vast majority, you know, more than ninety percent of the food tanks in the world, food is is held in tanks with a floating roof. The, the roof goes down when the, when the contents, but the oil goes down in the, in the tank and goes up when it gets filled. Mm -hmm. So satellites can now uh, send signals that uh, 
when you come in, it's not it's not like a Google Earth picture. It's not like a Google Map. Uh, it's, yes, a bunch of data is very very difficult to read and, and understand. You need special software to actually download the data. Uh, but but you can train algorithms to recognize uh, signals there that indicate how much oil is held in the tanks. You can you know, uh, identify the tanks with geolocation uh, and uh, you know, identify which which uh, what what uh, type of commodity the tanks hold, whether they hold food or other commodities, uh, gasoline, diesel, fuel oil, whatever. And you you can actually measure you know, through uh, observations about the placement of the roof, the amount of oil, and then you can aggregate those numbers to assess uh, global inventories in the world, or you can really look in a very granular way to see whether this refinery that maybe you want to sell oil to or buy oil to uh, is swimming in oil, or on the contrary, it's getting dry, and it's uh, getting short oil, it really needs to go to the market and refill the tanks. So it's, it, but you can also try. You can also, you know, look at uh, oil in caverns. There's different technologies to, to look at under the ground. Mm -hmm. You can look at uh, movements of uh, of uh, trucks, as you said. You can look at uh, rail movements. Uh, ship movements is something that's widely. Uh, there's not many companies doing this. It's actually the easiest part because ships have uh, uh, transponders and they have uh, they, they, they have beam deflection mm -hmm. uh, satellites and they can be followed. So. so Occasionally, ships turn off their transponders. That's what Iranian tankers like to do. And it becomes more difficult to track them, but it's not possible. There's ways to get around. Uh, to what extent recent developments in oil markets can impact natural gas markets? To what extent do the development of oil yeah. and gas? To what extent the increasing oil prices can impact natural gas? Ah. Yeah. Well, it, it's the uh, prices are somewhat, somewhat interconnected. It, yeah, it's a it's a tricky question because it's uh, the price of natural gas uh, tends to be indexed to oil. Not everywhere, but the, uh, in a bunch of markets, uh, the, the price of of gas follows oil sometimes with a with a lag. So, uh, in terms of uh, uh, cost based competition, fuel on fuel competition between oil and gas. There's limits to uh, how much gas prices can move independently from oil prices. Let, let me try to answer the question. So there are various, there, there's various uh, <coughs> things to keep in mind to, in trying to answer this question. First of all, there's what is the degree of uh, switching capacity in, in among consumers between oil and gas? Now, does oil is oil and do oil and gas really compete for the same markets, or are they used in very different ways in dedicated applications? Uh, if you if your house is uh, if you if your house is um, is uh, heated by gas uh, and you have a gas boiler in your house, chances are you're you're bound to use gas. You cannot really switch to oil on a dime. You know, some sometimes you can, but more, in most cases you're kind of weathered to a certain fuel by, by infrastructure. So most cars uh, obviously use oil. Uh, there are a few cars that use compressed <coughs> gas. There's a few trucks that use LNG, but for the most part it's oil. So the switching capacity is limited. And regarding, regardless of how the price of oil and, and gas compare, there's limited capacity to switch between one and the other. There's some capacity. So in, in Japan, uh, for example, uh, for example, you have power plants uh, that are nuclear, but you have also power plants that are uh, oil-fired and power plants that are gas-fired. And some power plants can switch between oil and gas. Or electric utilities can decide to utilize their oil plants more or less to maximize uh, uh, processing at the gas plant more or less, depending on the market. So, and they've been doing that in the last few years. So when uh, Fukushima happened, uh, there was uh, the, the nuclear plant went down, there was a need for ramping up the resources. LNG demand from Japan went to the roof, energy prices went, uh, took off. Uh, but since then, uh, Japan has been trying to cut back because of the price burden of the, the gas bill and uh, maximize more uh, oil production. So there's some competition that's limited. Uh, but, but I think in, in future, we're gonna see more competition uh, because there's, uh, particularly in places like China and India, there's a huge requirement to improve the air quality. 
Uh, and it's not really driven by climate concerns and global warming, uh, although that's maybe part of it at the market. The key issue is air quality in big cities, uh, like uh, particularly like Beijing, Shanghai, or New Delhi, where the air quality is extremely poor, and there's a very deliberate, very urgent policy drive uh, driven by regulations, driven by subsidies, to move away from oil and to encourage cleaner uh, sources of fuel uh, as a replacement to improve the air quality. So uh, the vast fleet uh, of many Chinese cities has been or is being converted to gas uh, in a huge way. Uh, taxis uh, are uh, CNG powered in many cities and so on and so forth. So they have growingly uh, more penetration of gas, more inroads of gas into areas that until recently seemed that they were really uh, something that all had the lock on and really faced on the position. And then there's the issue of how price is formed. And it's true that in many cases, the contracts, the natural gas contracts, the price is based on an index of, of oil, an input oil index is driven by oil prices. But that's not a one-on-one -on -one relationship. It's not an instant relationship. There's lags and there's different. Uh, so it doesn't apply instantly and on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And also, more and more um, gas customers have been calling for decoupling uh, oil from gas, and also have been calling for moving away from long-term contracts at a fixed formula price towards short-term contracts more on the spot basis. So the pricing regime of gas is changing, is undergoing a revolution, uh, which will make it easier in a way for gas to compete with oil uh, in the market on a price basis, even as the capacity to use gas across many sectors of activity will also increase. Although we can argue and this is strange that increase in oil prices, even that a good part of natural gas contracts in Asia are indexed to oil will rise the price of natural gas and this will make coal more competitive and so we can have at the same time increasing oil prices and increasing CO2 emissions by, by, uh, from coal. Yeah, on the price basis, there's, there's a risk. Uh, but then again, you have uh, big efforts to curb coal use, at least in certain urban centers. Uh, so, yeah, you, you, you may be right for greenhouse gas emissions uh, in aggregate. But in discrete markets, that might not exactly play out this way because there's going to be, you know, in major cities, an effort to, to clean up the air. It's not just in emerging markets, in, in places like Paris or London. There's a big push to, uh, to cut back on, uh, on um, uh, car use, basically on uh, non-electric car use, and a big push to encourage either no, no cars or electric vehicles. So more and more cities are adopting bans, car bans or diesel bans, uh, effective 2030, 2040. Uh, so that's, and, and even though those are long term, uh, it's already driving uh, investment uh, decisions even by consumers. So Paris, a few years ago, uh, said there would be a ban on diesel cars in 2020. People would not be able to buy new diesel cars starting in 2020, because diesel was found to be a gas engineer by the World Health uh, Organization in 2012, creates particular emissions that are bad for health. Uh, but as soon as Paris announced a 2020 target of no diesel cars, customers started moving away from, from diesel cars and buying gasoline cars instead. So it, it, those, those things have, uh, have short term effects and immediate effects. Mm -hmm. And one last question, if you don't mind. What may be Javier? Yeah, not Javier. Talking about the narrative to engage investors or to approach to investors and companies, knowing that energy peak demand is not going to happen, at least. So it's going to be like a share change about oil and electricity by any kind of generation. Ha do you consider that the oil companies are going to be changed to electric companies, knowing that it's the only way for changing for renewables, if it's solar or wind? Because I understand that the business models are quite different. The risk is different, but the profits are so different. So the same thing that happened with shale, that it was like newborn companies are going to be the ones that are driving this new change, or big oil companies can be able to have different structures 
And knowing that even if the market share changed between oil and renewables, I think that the BP outlook states that we need like to find oil fields like for 15 million barrels per day. And we need to change the actual fields for new ones, which means a lot of investment, a lot of drilling. So do you consider that oil companies can still in that looking for these new 15 million plus changing all the oil fields as a business model or they're going to have like maybe two departments or they're going to be fully changed or how yeah. that could uh, be? Well, they're trying to reinvent themselves. So most companies are trying to show that they are preparing for an age of diminished oil consumption. Uh, nobody expects energy consumption to diminish. Right? The energy consumption continues to grow because demand for energy services increases. There's actually new users for energy all the time. Computers, data centers, all that consumes a, a lot of energy. So I don't think anybody expects really aggregate energy to go down, but more the mix to change and, and oil consumption to go down perhaps uh, for the benefit of uh, electricity. Uh, admittedly, electricity can be made with gas or, or with, uh, with nuclear, but also uh, with uh, coal and, uh, and oil. So it, it, it's a complicated discussion. But generally speaking, to answer your question, I think more and more companies, especially publicly traded companies, are now reinventing themselves as energy companies with a more diversified portfolio. Uh, they're increasingly investing in gas as opposed to oil. So Shell, for example, now produces is more gas company than oil company. Uh, its shell assets now exceed its oil assets. Uh, and uh, they're also increasingly investing in renewables and in electricity. Uh, so uh, a company like Total is predominantly a oil company, but it has made a series of very high profile investments and very large investments in solar companies, in power distribution companies. Uh, it's developing its gas production in a big way. So there's a, there's a shift in the, in the portfolio of these companies and in the range of services that those companies offer. The, the question that you raise is, is valid. Uh, are, are those companies necessarily well placed to expand? Uh, is a null company, does a null company have a competitive advantage in the renewable sector? or is renewable something completely different from oil, where an oil company might not actually be particularly well suited to compete. Uh, so that's a very valid question. Uh, it's, it's not a completely new question. The oil industry has gone through those cycles. Uh, back in the 70s, uh, Exxon was investing in a lot of things, including nuclear, including even hotels. Exxon uh, used to own a bunch of hotels that they then sold. Uh, so the companies that have, over the years, gone through that kind of uh, existential crisis and have tried to diversify, reinvent themselves, often have abandoned those efforts as the market change and the oil, the, uh, investment interest in the oil market came back and they, they kind of regrouped and, and went back to what they were most qualified and most expert at. Uh, so in, in future, I, it's an open question. I don't know what the answer is, but uh, companies are, are trying to learn. Uh, they're trying to find areas of renewables, for example, where they can best use their technological competitiveness, their know-how. An example would be Statoil, for example, which uh, is a company that has a lot of offshore oil production, so they know offshore oil, 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 oil <coughs> platforms well, including in very difficult conditions in the North Sea, uh, with high wind conditions and so on, uh, even in the Arctic. Uh, so they're developing a portfolio of uh, wind production, wind electricity production, but they specialize in offshore wind. Stato has become a, a, a leader of offshore wind generation. It's building an offshore wind farm uh, near New York, actually, Long Island. Uh, and it's, it's great at doing that. The thing is, the cost of those projects is really high. So it, it's, uh, the, the cost competitiveness of these offshore wind projects is, is debatable today. But in the future, it may be something that would be very relevant and very profitable. So it's, you know, companies do this. Uh, so some, they try to find out how their skills can be best applied to the renewable sector. But it, it's all to the electric sector and so on. Okay. Um, there's, a, there's a sense that the business of the companies will be not to produce, to produce oil, but 
but to offer energy services. Uh, and this will be, this will entail going further down the supply chain, and this will entail also a great deal of optionality to fuels, uh, switching between oil, gas, renewables, electricity, depending on the population. If you look, for example, at the power plants, at the, at the, uh, at the uh, thank you, at the um, um, generators produced by companies like Marzilla. Marzilla is a big generator, uh, producer for power plants and also for uh, industrial and uh, residential users. So they now produce uh, uh, generators for power plants that can run either on gas or on diesel or on residual fuel oil, depending on the price. Uh, Puerto Rico is buying those, uh, those generators. And uh, they have flexibility, they have optionality. That's, that's becoming the kind of the buzzword. Optionality is becoming you know, a, key, a key aspect that the companies want to offer to the customers and the customers are expecting from this environment. Yeah, I just want to uh, show uh, the example of my company about uh, your question, and I work for the uh, nuclear power company. About 10 years ago, my company just focused on nuclear in China. Uh, but uh, gradually we found that maybe there's a gap for the nuclear, and it's uh, just a transition energy. So about five years ago, we tried to uh, enter the renewable energy market, like uh, solar and wind. And during the five years, this market developed so quickly. And now the total capacity uh, of renewable for in our company has been surpassed the, the nuclear. So you could see that uh, if there is a really great future of the of a market, that uh, the company make the right choice that it could develop really quickly. And uh, but uh, in the last several years, we try to focus. Uh, we, we try to find some target uh, outside of China. I mean, do some M&A in Europe or in uh, South Asia. And uh, uh, at that time, the uh, one of the most reason that we do that is we just want to diversify the energy source like the gas, oil. So we try to find the different types of this market. So how did you, if I may ask a question now, turn, turn the table on you. Um, <laughs> How did, how did your company do that? Did, did they develop the know-how internally, or did they buy uh, oh, other companies that? Uh, M&A. Yes, M&A. Uh, outside of China, M&A. Uh, in, in China, uh, both. Just the way we by ourselves, or just the purchase some assets. Hi, uh, I have a question. I came from a uh, refinery. We have a mismatch of our product demand because, like uh, nowadays, China's uh, cars. Uh, uh, holding uh, capacity is maybe constant and we need less uh, diesel and gasoline but we need a lot of jet fuel because the airline is, industry is booming so how can we deal with that? I, I mean we can change, is that a global issue or, we, or it just happened in China? No, it's very much a global issue. Um, you have very different rates of uh, growth across different products. Yeah. So as you said, jet fuel is a booming product. Demand is growing rapidly because air travel demand and air freight demand is, is just expanding massively. Um, gasoline demand is more uh, challenged, depending on the regions, but generally speaking, it's more challenged. Diesel demand you know, is complicated. Diesel has many different uses, so it's a, different, it's a, it's a complicated outlook to figure out. But LPG demand is, is growing very strong for petrochemicals. So it, it is. It is a very uh, relevant question worldwide. It's not uh, limited to, to to your companies, to your refineries, to everywhere. And it's something that actually is very relevant when you try to think about peak demand. And most projections of peak demand, as far as I know, have not really tried to think very hard about the question. But if, if you think about the main narrative that uh, you know, EVs are going to replace ICE vehicles. So no more gasoline demand, but a lot of EV demand, uh, electricity demand. What does that mean for refineries that normally produce you know, somewhere around 25% gasoline, let uh, so 50% gasoline? So will they be able to find new catalysts to, to re-engineer their plants to diminish the yield of gasoline uh, and produce more where it is needed, jet fuel? Or will they be struggled with 
huge amount of gasoline that they would not have a market for, so that could cause them to collapse. And I think that's one of the scenarios behind the rapid displacement of oil across the board. The idea is that if you lose 25% of the market, that we basically crush the rest of the industry because the, the, the refineries would not know what to do with that 25% of the market, and they can't. They, they won't find the market to absorb it, or they will have to take a, a, a cost that will be unbearable. Uh, or the opposite view is the price of gasoline will go down mm -hmm. so that we make it much more difficult for EVs to compete with gasoline and that we prolong the, the, the life of, of gasoline vehicles. Perhaps in other markets, perhaps refiners will export their gasoline uh, to markets where car makers will export their ICE vehicles, even as EVs you know, make inroads in their own market. So you know, refineries in California might no longer have a market for the gasoline uh, because California might go all electric, but they might ship the gasoline to Ecuador or to uh, other places in Latin America where you might still have a very strong growth because the and, and growth might be particularly strong because the price of gasoline will be lower. So uh, that's, uh, that's the issue of feedback effects of the market and uh, uh, trying to model and understand uh, the uh, Cost effects of demand across sectors and across regions is one of the big challenges uh, when you try to, to model uh, the, the outlook for global on that uh, on the world scale. Another question is that I, I came I also I came from a, a company that owns both refinery and petrochemical, and uh, if w our pre preference is if we can use uh, natural gas as as um, petrochemical uh, resources, we don't use uh, refinery products. So is that the trend, by the way, are short in natural gas supplies? But if there is uh, enough infrastructure, mm -hmm. like we can have in, uh, unlimited natural gas supply, is that be a trend that petrochemical is shifting from a, a oil related? Right. So that's gas? another kind of uncertainty in the market because uh, typically the the, uh, some of the key inputs into the petrochemical plants come from ethane or propane. Yeah. And ethane or propane themselves are kind of uh, um, ambiguous uh, fuels because they can come from the, from the oil uh, um. production uh, uh, cycle or they can come from the gas production cycle. Yeah. They are basically between oil and gas and they can be a byproduct of gas production or byproduct of, of we go over that in the class. Yeah. So a lot of another forecast, like the IEA forecast, you know, says uh, in the Rio, all demand will remain strong because there will be so much uh, petrochemical demand. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not it's not clear that that petro petrochemical demand will support the oil sector uh, or or the gas sector. Um, in, in the U.S., you've seen in the last ten years an incredible revival of the petrochemical industry. It was a dying industry uh, 15 years ago, uh, and it was using NAFTA as an input, yeah. uh, primary input to make petrochemical uh, building blocks and, and, and products. Uh, but since the Shea revolution, which initially started with gas before it started to spread to oil, natural gas production in the US has gone through the roof, natural gas prices have collapsed, and that has supported a huge growth in petrochemical uh, activity using gas as an input, not oil. Uh, in, uh, in the Middle East, uh, it's either oil or gas, NAFTA or, 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 or gas that's used as, a, as an input, but it has to be more gas. Uh, and uh, China, China and, and India have both options. So it's yeah, we, we mainly use NAFTA, but if we have an option, like right. use natural gas in summer, but you, in winter we cannot use natural gas because the utility right. uh, demand is quite large. But we prefer to natural gas because it's the most light and less carbon uh, emission to our uh, instrument. Yeah, okay. interesting. Uh, thank you for your here and for this uh, lecture, it was amazing. I have one question about US shale oil. You mentioned that the narrative about the abundance of shale oil is still with us. And I want to uh, ask you about the last book of Bethany McLean, 
that she mentions that the, the book Saudi Arabia, in which she mentions that the success of the oil, in the shale oil industry is not because of the efficiencies, but because of the cheap capital that the, these companies that you mentioned uh, could access. So I want to know what's your opinion on all that. So I haven't, I haven't read the book. I've, I've read uh, the op-ed that she wrote for the New York Times a few, a few weeks ago. Um, and I, my impression is that she, my impression was that it felt like something that people were saying in 2014 when the price collapsed. And there was a lot of concern that the shale industry would not survive the, the collapse in the oil price. Uh, and some economies came with forecasts that the, the shale industry would, would go bankrupt on a massive scale that would disappear. There's an economist called uh, Philip Berger, who's very bright and often very provocative, and he wrote uh, uh, produced analysis at the time saying the, the shale industry is going to be wiped out by the collapse in the oil price. And that, that did not happen at all. The, the shale industry, you know, so some companies did go bankrupt. There, there's been some consolidation and there's, there's been some you know, restructuring of the sector. But shale production as a whole has continued to grow, barely, barely dropped uh, during the, the, and the worst of the price collapse that quickly rebounded and has been growing even faster than anybody expected uh, now and is expected to continue to grow very rapidly. The, the only thing holding back shale production today is really uh, the lack of uh, logistics, the lack, the lack of takeaway capacity, pipeline, and so on. So I, I think uh, you know she's a she's a very well known uh, reporter. Uh, she writes well. I, I did not read the book, but her book about Enron was a, uh, a very important book and a, a very good piece of reporting. I think in the case of Shea, there's a few things she doesn't really quite get. And uh, um, you know, the, the, it's true that. Low interest rates have been a facilitator of the industry, but it's not, uh, the industry doesn't depend on it. Uh, the industry also has changed dramatically in the last few years. So, and, and here I have to qualify what I started saying uh, a few minutes ago uh, when I was discussing shit. It started with small companies, highly leveraged, um, and uh, you know, exposed to, uh, to, to, to interest rates fluctuations. But it's changed very much over the years, and there's been a huge amount of uh, consolidation. And also the, the majors, the, the, or the IOCs, uh, have come back, have invested in the shale sector in a big way. So uh, the idea of a contrast between small shale nimble producers and big oil companies, very slow moving, very you know, old fashioned, heavy, slow to respond, that contrast is less valid today than it was two or three years ago. Uh, and uh, companies like Exxon, Chevron, have made massive investments in the shale sector, and have bought billions and billions of dollars of uh, assets uh, in the Permian and elsewhere. Um, and uh, so it, it's, it, you've seen the, the, the big oil companies move into shale. At the same time, shale companies, the shale companies that have been the most successful, have grown dramatically themselves, have absorbed parts of others and uh, have acquired uh, you know, deeper, um, um, deeper resources. Um, and, and generally speaking, I think the market is much less exposed to financial risks than uh, could, could uh, seem to be the case a few years ago. But try to find time to read The Frankers. The Frankers is a very nice book. The Frankers is a very nice book. A good read, enjoyable, and fun. Very good read. You know it? No, I read the fracking <coughs> revolution, also wrote by, by another uh, sponsor by the Global Center of right. Energy Policy. Right. It's really good. Daniel Remy. What time? Remy, by Daniel Yes, Remy. yes. Right. Uh, it's a whole different story than the one that Bethany yeah. exposes in her book. But I think it's it's important to read different perspectives. Sure. <coughs> the Frankers is a very interesting chronicle of how um, the sh the industry developed, and you get to know that it's not uh, any motivation produced by scientists, but by businessmen and people extremely determined, working with very fragile business models, but it was a combination of talent, innovation, and good timing. Yeah, but it's already a few years old. So since the Frankers came out, 
the industry has changed a bit, as, as you would expect, of course, yeah. And everybody was basically wrong, but you know, I've been teaching here for nine years, right. and what I heard, my most distinguished friends say about art, I should not take a list. Right. We have common friends that we highly respect, and they said things that are totally wrong, and sometimes they think they say things that they are wrong, and true, but years later, they are, they are right. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This well, is a very tricky business. Yeah, you have to stick to your, your uh, if, you're, if you stick to your long enough, you know, talking the problem clock is uh, my price in there. It's like the, the watch, I mean, if you stick to, to 12 o'clock sooner or later, it will be there. <laughs> no, but it, it's true because the, uh, the oil uh, sector, the oil industry, touches on virtually every aspect of uh, society, the economy, and so on. So you might be an expert on the technology of oil, but miss the geopolitical aspect, or you might, you might, you might understand the geopolitics very well, but miss the, uh, the demand uh, or the economics. So there's always something you miss. There's no. There are a few generalists who try to piece everything together, but they don't have themselves the depth that the uh, expert in each sector might have. So it's it's a it's a sector that swipe for surprises and uh, uh, misperceptions and uh, uh, wrong forecasts, wrong generalizations, and so on, which makes it fun. Thank you very much for your. Generosity and your patience. No, no, no. Uh, we love the, 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 the presentation. For you guys who are writing an essay on oil, please. Please. Uh, we love the, the generosity of, of our friend. And uh, not least, you heard that uh, the comp your company means more than the same. Yeah, true. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> you've been experienced at life. Okay. And if you have follow up questions, you know where to find me at the center down there. Down there, down there. Thank you very much. Thank you. In a very special moment, this lecture, because